Hello everyone, I'm Bonnie Lowe Craman. For 25 years, I worked as the personal assistant to actors Olympia Dukakis and Louise Orich. I am the author of this book, Be the Ultimate Assistant, a celebrity assistant secrets to working with any high powered employer. I train assistants at the Be the Ultimate Assistant workshops, and I've been traveling, teaching and speaking with uh, in companies uh, with assistance with their leaders to build ultimate partnerships. So I'm very uh, committed to building a better workplace. Today, I'm here to talk about the hard stuff, death and dying. Uh, in my work, I often talk about Olympia and Louis, who happened to pass away in the last few years. Um, but I have vast experience unfortunately, uh, with different sides of death and dying, having lost both my parents, a sister, several close friends, and of course, Olympia and Louis. Um, and because of this, I am something of a subject matter expert in, in this. So why am I talking about this? Uh, death and dying are not usually on at the top of the list for favorite things to discuss, but we absolutely need to because of what happens if we don't discuss it. In our society, we do a great job celebrating and planning for the beginning of life. We have gender reveal parties and we document every aspect of a woman's pregnancy but we don't spend the same kind of time and energy on the end of life, which of course we know is inevitable, but it, it seems to be a really uncomfortable subject for so many folks. But that's exactly why we need to talk about it. And here's another reason why we need to deal with this subject in trainings like this one. You know why? Because assistants often get pulled into this with their executives, but you will never find the information that I'm going to be covering in this next period of time in an employee manual. It's just not there. So my goal for our time together today is by the end of it, my hope is that you will have a clear plan of action uh, based on your own situation. Um, my hope is that you will feel more peace of mind about this tricky subject. And I'm going to be providing you some really great resources. Um, my hope is that you will have better communication with your executive and your team if you choose to discuss this with them and that your stress will be lower because of the clarity that is, has come from, you know, really just understanding the landscape a little better. So let's begin with some hard truths. We know that people die for all kinds of reasons. And right now in the world and the workplace, we are, we're in a situation where people are getting sick and dying of COVID by the thousands. And they're also dying from a myriad of other illnesses. Um, we have extreme weather happening everywhere and people are, are passing away and lives are being taken from, from that. The bottom line, my goodness, life is unpredictable, isn't it? At, and it's not an understatement to say that. Uh, assistants are on the front lines of hearing when bad things happen, especially to your executives. You, as the assistant, are going to be one of the first to know. And then what? The big question that I'm asking you to ask yourself, and you don't have to tell anybody other than yourself, is are you ready for that call to come? I know that this is not a fun subject, uh, which is exactly why we need to talk about it. So what happens if you don't take action on this subject? Either way, whether you act or you don't act, you are still going to be the one who is going to be called upon to solve the problem or at least some of the problems. Um, you know, I wonder if any of you have known anyone who has passed away without a will. 
I have. There are so many reasons to have a will. And if you've known somebody who died without one, that will pretty much tell you everything you need to know. Um, and, and I'm really clear on how difficult a subject this is because I personally know many people, several people, to be fair, who are super smart and I care about them so much and yet they don't have a will. And so there are lots of mental preparations that need to be in place for people to go ahead and uh, and create a will. You know, it requires an acknowledgement. Yep, I am going to die. I am going to die someday. You know, to die without a will puts the control of your money, your assets. And if you have kids or pets, it puts all the control of all of those things in the hands of somebody else, a stranger, because the court has no other choice because there's no documentation. So I urge you to read up on what happens legally if someone passes away without a will, um, your executive or you even. So a couple of quick examples that if you're single and you die without a will, your assets will automatically go to your parents. If you have no parents, it will automatically go to your siblings. So they go down the list of like closest relatives. But what if that's not what you really want to have happen? Uh, if the person who dies has underage children, the, uh, the court will have no choice but to assign a guardian for those kids and sometimes split them up. And I, I believe that any parent would want to have control over who to choose as the guardian rather than a stranger. And then, you know, one of my own relatives died fairly recently without a will, and that automatically sends the estate into something called probate. You know, this, this whole subject has a language, a vocabulary all its own. The family had to hire a lawyer and it goes through a process that includes things like, you know, the lawyer has to put an ad in the newspaper. It's called due diligence. An ad in the newspaper to say that a person has died and that, uh, you know, if anyone has a claim towards those assets that they need to come forward by a certain date. And so this put into motion, you know, like 90 days of waiting for life insurance and, you know, transfer of funds from, um, you know, uh, investment accounts. What I can tell you for sure is that things go a whole lot faster if there's a will. Assistants are often the ones who have to say the hard things. When it comes to tough subjects, what I see is that it is often the assistant who takes on the responsibility of addressing the tough subjects. And that applies to a lot of things, not only death and dying, it's often the assistant who has all the details. And so she has to, she or he has to raise her hand and say, well, not sure we've thought about that. What I've observed in the world in general, and I see it in my own family, is that every family, every group of people, a department in a company, for example, has a grown up. I call them the grown-ups, the person who is the one who inevitably takes on the responsibility of the hard things, of saying the hard things. There's usually a family has a grown-up in it, the person who's willing to take those, those tough things on. And maybe that's some of you, I can envision you nodding right now thinking, yep, that's me, I'm the grown-up in my family, in my department. So the question for the grown-ups is how and when do we bring up this subject? You know, none of us, none of us wants to go over a line or to venture into an area that someone might say, hey, that's none of your business. You know, why are you asking? But the thing is, it is our business. As assistants to executives, you know, you're privy to the travel plans and sometimes you're the only one with those with those details it's important to find your moment 
to ask the question about to what degree your involvement is desired in the process of death and dying. Uh, what I find useful is to use an example of something that happened recently, you know, in your, a person in your orbit, say it's um, Joe who came down with COVID and being seriously ill. So, you know, you can say something to your executive like, well, you know, and this actually happened by the way, that, that the assistant, the Joe did not have a spouse, he was single. And so the assistant kept getting called by the hospital for medical records and questions about advanced directives. Advanced directive is that document that says if you want extraordinary measures taken to keep you alive. And so uh, oftentimes doctors will ask, do you have one of those documents, those official documents? You know, the, you can say to your executive, you know, the situation with Joe is stressful enough, but you know, now there's even more stress because the assistant had to go to Joe's house and search for papers and he's not feeling well. So, you know, he's not really eager to talk on the phone uh, to tell her where even to go. So it, it's super stressful. So the question is, uh, you know, to your executive, if you ever get sick, you know, whether it's COVID or something else, do you want me to get involved with this information? And, and do you want me to keep the paperwork organized so that we don't have to go through what they're going through and we could make it less stressful for us? So it's it, using a real life situation I find is, is um, really helpful. Here are a few photos from my work with Olympia Dukakis and Louis Zorich. Uh, we worked together for 25 years and um, you can imagine that in all of that time, we shared many uh, situations together. We shared all the ups and downs of life, births, deaths, weddings, divorces, award ceremonies, um, you name it, we, it really did run the gamut. We shared it all. There were times of great joy and times of tremendous sadness. And what I came to understand is that e this subject was tricky to, to discuss as close as we were. And over the years, you know, I was very involved with booking doctor's appointments and getting to know the doctors and actually uh, going to uh, office visits with doctors. So I realized in time that I was not overstepping my bounds and that Louis and Olympia counted on me to keep track of all of these important papers and, and keep them organized. Now only you know if that's the case for you. Um, it's specific to your situation and the, uh, you know, to make decisions about whether you should even ask your executive about these subjects. But even so, I, I suspect if you're listening to this presentation that, that perhaps you're relating to this for your own life. Um, and that's valuable too, with, for your friends, for your family. And I know, I know many assistants though, who are pulled into this situation and they are keeping track of the important papers for their executives and so that they know that when the day comes, when they get that call, that they will be ready. And that, that's what I believe ultimate assistants do. You ask the tough questions all in the effort to be ready. We lost Louis Zorich in 2018. This is a picture from the memorial service in New York City. Um, he passed away after a series of long, a, a, a long series of illnesses. He was 94. Now I was no longer working with them in 2018. I had left in 2011 to go off and travel and speak and teach. But of course we stayed in close touch and I was still, even though I wasn't working with them, still one of the first phone calls to hear the news. And I remember 
I remember at the time the feeling of jumping back into my old life. You know, it's kind of like assistants never lose it. You never lose that that impulse to help and be useful. Um, one thought I had at the time about obituaries when you know obituaries appear and talk about how the person who died is survived by survived by their spouse survived by their family and i often think well in certain situations it really should say survived by their assistance as the memorial was planned for new york i offered to run front of house and what that meant was being the official greeter as people came into the event um, because really after 25 years of working with them i would know most everybody coming into the space so that way i could be alert if there was anybody who shouldn't be there um, and i just remember wanting to work to make sure everything went smoothly you know, I helped with the planning. I came early. I stayed until it was sure that it was all going fine. You know, so with the death of an executive, an assistant is not only dealing with your own grief, as I was, but in this case, I was dealing with Olympia's grief and the family and her friends and the 200 people who showed up that night at the La Mama Theater in New York City. It was that night that I realized that I had known Louis Zorich longer than I had known my own father who passed away when I was 15 years old. And that's the kind of relationship that assistants have with their managers. And it, it makes it so valuable if the assistant can be invited to be involved with this kind of tough, situation that happens in life and you know it's just it's life isn't it what i have learned and that it was fully in play at louis memorial is that life is full filled with these times of great sadness and grief and it's juxtaposed you know on the very same day that the memorial was happening there are things that happen in life that are very joyful and happy and, and fill you with joy and love. Um, you know, at the memorial, there I am on, in, with Olympia. I was in a very familiar role um, by her side, protecting her as we moved her into the audience. At, that was at the beginning of the event. And she was greeting people. And my strongest memory is how much love there was in the room that night. And as an assistant, as a human being, there was no other place on earth I would have preferred to be that night than in that room with Olympia and the family and honoring this man who I knew so closely for so many years. And, and looking back, I'm really proud to say that it, it did run very smoothly. Stepping back into my old role as an assistant, even though I'd been gone for a few years, it just felt like flexing a muscle that was super ready to be flexed. Um, this next point is super important to make about this subject of death and dying and the relationship to assistance is that in general, an event like this is has high emotions and high stress associated with the people who are closest to the person who had died. So those folks are not necessarily thinking clearly thinking as clearly as they would at another kind of event. And that's why you're there. That's what I realized about why I was needed and what purpose assistance play in events like this. So then we fast forward to this year in 2021 when Olympia Dukakis passed away at the age of 89. Um, again, I was one of the first phone calls. She passed away on a Saturday morning and within hours, her death was, uh, was breaking news in, uh, you know, all over the world in, 
you know, in the international press. And by Sunday, I heard from hundreds of friends and fans, literally hundreds of emails in my inbox. It was overwhelming and it, um, it truly was hard to process. Those people who wrote me were expressing their own feelings of grief and memories of a woman who impacted their life in, in profound ways. Um, you know, she certainly impacted my life in that way. The family planned the memorial at an outdoor venue in New York City because of COVID. We were at the Delacorte Theater in Central Park. Now we knew we were taking a chance with the weather, which is something every assistant is thinking about when you're planning an outdoor event. You know, you're worried like, uh-oh, you know, are we gonna have a rain date? And what, what happens, you know, we run the what ifs. We have a plan A, we have a plan B, we have, you know, we try our best to plan for every eventuality. Well, we did not have a rain date and we had people flying in from all over the country. And of course it rained, it poured. And that the photo of me on the slide um, in the pouring rain, giving my speech, 250 people sat there in the rain to honor Olympia Dukakis. Um, those assistant muscles got to be flexed again that night. I ran front of house again, and um, and Patrick Healy is the man holding the umbrella for me in the photo. He took over for me as Olympia's assistant after I left in 2011, and he served as the MC that night at the memorial. So he was backstage and, and on stage, and I was uh, running front of house and being the official greeter again. Um, in front of the audience, I said to them, you know, so, hey, you get two assistants for the price of one. You know, most folks know who the assistants are because we were the way to get to Olympia and Louis. There were so many details to be worked through for that particular event at the Delacorte and it was Patrick dealing with most all of the details with the folks at the theater. And I was dealing with some of them. I certainly was coordinating. Um, once again, you know, the family was depending on Patrick and me to some degree to, to make sure things were going to go smoothly and that everything was in place for this event to come off. It fell to the assistants to have everything run smoothly and Patrick and I were there to make damned sure that it did. We, we both fell back into our old roles and, and we both felt like we were doing our jobs for Olympia and Louis to the very end um, and it felt great. And I suspect that would be the case for many of you who are listening to this presentation right now. So I want to continue on with the things that I learned and the research that I've done to help you have an easier time as you think about how you want to proceed in your own life and in the life of your executives and what kinds of questions to ask. Um, it's important that you get mentally prepared for what this is because this is tough stuff. It tends to hit a nerve and to raise feelings about your own mortality. Certainly the pandemic did that. A lot of people had the time to reflect on, on you know, their lives and were they doing what they wanted to do with their lives. So when we contemplate mortality, it can raise a lot of feelings. And I just want to reiterate that if you start if you as the assistant get pulled into this subject with your executive and you don't want to be, it's completely appropriate for you to say, I don't feel comfortable doing this. And so I, I think we'd like to find someone else to take this on to manage this kind of information. But assuming you do want to 
do this. Um, it's important that you do the research on this tough subject. Um, there's a lot to know and it's specific to your state and your industry perhaps and, and to the preferences of your executives. Uh, documents. You want to keep great records. If you're getting involved with this, it's you know, I used to keep mine in red, red folders so that the family knew what I was holding on, that, that this was very important information. So, you know, doctors, appointments and, and contact information and medical records so that you have all of that at your fingertips when you get asked for it. The research that you do, I urge you to put it in writing um, so that there's documentation. Inevitably, uh, somebody is going to want to talk about the subject on a weekend or at nighttime when you're not necessarily around. It will be important for you to choose your moment about when to discuss these kinds of things. And as I mentioned before, it's, it's useful to use a, a timely example you know, as your bridge into the subject. And then if you realize that it's not a good time, then you'll say, you know, maybe we can talk about it next month and then be sure to follow up because what you don't want to have happen is for anybody to die on your watch and for there, for there to be very little information. You want to have a plan of action, assuming that you have the conversation with your executive it will be important to discover, well, okay, what's the next logical step in the process? Is it to contact the lawyer and make an appointment for to, to discuss creating a will? And that's going to, most lawyers will send like a questionnaire with things to fill out. And that will be another way to have another conversation. So that, um, and then you'll know how how detailed does your executive want you to get in this material? You know, it's going to say, you know, who are your heirs and who do you, you know, who are you designating um, for power of attorney? And we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, really important to create a when I die folder. You know, I went on the internet and there are lots of books, templates with this kind of information. That happens to be one of the images that's available out there. There are books on this subject. You know, the things to think about as you prepare, you know, it used to be referred to as, um, you know, making your arrangements, you know, get your, get your affairs in order was the word we, words we used to hear. So this is all about planning for the conversation. This is where an assistance organizational skills can really shine. And you know, they you they kick in because if there's anything assistants know how to do really well, it's to organize this kind of information and to structure what what should come next in the process of gathering the information. Um, you know, you can't create a will without all the, without thinking through some of the really hard decisions that, that need to happen. Um, and then on to the details. So you have the beginnings of the conversation and now it's about getting nitty gritty with the details. Uh, these details not only help your executive, but they can also help you. I know so many assistants who ended up getting their own paperwork in order as they worked through it with their executive. So, so important to involve the family or the important people in your executive's life. So you can't be, the assistant cannot be the only one with the password or know where the key is or know where the documents are. The most important document if there's anything you're going to help your executive create, it's going to be the will. The will is, in, and yes, there are free templates on the internet that you can use to create a will, but it's been advised to me to pay the money for a real lawyer 
in your state where you live because so many laws are specific to the state where someone lives. So it, it most lawyers will do, you know, a complimentary call to to just get uh, to give you some basic information. And sometimes that will give you the answers you need in order to take the next logical step. But the will, if there's anything you take away from this presentation, is the importance of that document. Even for young people, as soon as a person is working on their own, it's important to have a will because life is unpredictable. You just never know. Passwords, safe deposit box. It's vital that the assistant is not the only person to have the passwords, you know, ways into banking and, uh, you know, typically a bank is where a safe deposit box would be. Where's the key stored? Is there a second key? Who's the signature, the signatory on the safe deposit box? Does the banking account have a second signature? Is it you know, hopefully on any bank account for your executive, there's someone who is given, you know, authority to sign checks or to, you know, act on behalf of the executive. And sometimes many, many assistants are that person. Um, the details include having all the contact information for all the doctors, including cell phones, prescription, you know, pharmacists um, and the lawyers contact information. Super important for you to, for the assistant to have all of this information very orderly in a place that more than you knows about. Living will. A living will is also referred to as an advanced directive. That's the document that doctors ask for if you go in the hospital for a procedure that if something goes wrong, um, the living will will indicate, you know, do you have a DNR, do not resuscitate. That's the acronym for that. So it's a very personal decision, but it is something that gets asked and lawyers will ask that question. So it raises a lot of, you know, um, questions that you might not have thought about before. Who's got power of attorney? Power of attorney is another phrase from the legal world. It is about if someone becomes disabled or unable to act on their own behalf, who has power of attorney to act on your executive's behalf? Who has power of attorney to act on your behalf? Um, and that's, that's an important decision to make for yourself. A power of attorney will be the person in charge of, of managing your estate after a person dies. So it's gotta be somebody you trust really well. Um, medical treatments, it's the lawyer will ask about, you know, to what, if a person has cancer, to what degree does a person want any and all medical treatments to stay alive at what point is another decision made um, that's when hospice may come into play so there's a there's a lot to know here and may not be able to get solved certainly in one conversation it's a lot for sure insurance policies are more details about life insurance policies and when do they take effect and who's the beneficiary so it's it's very helpful if the assistant can keep track of all of these documents in a clearly defined place with more than the assistant knowing where it is and have them keep up to date. Um, most lawyers will say that it's important to do a new will or to look at the will every four to five years, but certainly if there's any big change in circumstances, that's the word they use, change in circumstances, you know, a new grandchild, a new, you know, somebody you want to take out of the will, somebody, you know, tons of movies uh, have this plot point in their 
you know, how at the last minute a will is changed to add someone, to take someone out. Um, it's not always in real life that dramatic, but sometimes it is. And my goodness, what I have seen is that money conflicts between siblings and family members can get really awful. And so to have all of the documentation really clear sets you up for a minimum of angst as you go th through this process. So final arrangements, um, when your executive or someone passes away, there are lots of things that have to be decided. And here on this slide will be some of those things to think about. And I'm going to be giving you resources so that you can get really nitty gritty on all of this. Uh, your the person who has passed away, hopefully they have made their wishes known to their loved ones about whether they want to be buried or cremated. Pretty major decision because then that sets off a series of, well, where are those remains going to live, so to speak? You know, which cemetery do you choose? And, you know, lots of your local funeral home will be happy to give you information on this. That's part of the research that I'm urging you to do. Pre hopefully you will have had a full conversation with your executive about these things. What kind of service does he or she envision? Wouldn't it be great for us all to have the kind of memorial after we pass away that, that we want, as opposed to letting other people guess as to what, what it is we want. So a big service, a small service, should there be, you know, a, a religious leader there as, you know, being a part of the event or not religious at all? And who will do the speaking? Uh, who gets invited? Some people have very strong feelings. Oh, I want it very simple. Others want, you know, a bigger event. Who speaks? Does your executive have strong feelings about who, you know, who particularly they want to speak? Uh, will there be music? And if so, what kind of music? Many people are pretty specific about that. I mean, I have strong feelings about that for myself. The obituary. Who writes it? Who writes that? Um, that's a decision to be made. It's not always the person you might assume would write it. Will there be flowers? Do you want flowers? Do you want a donation given to, to some entity? Um, are cars needed for transportation for folks? Will there be a printed program? So many things to think about. At the service, will there be videos shown? Will there be photos, a photo montage? If so, who's putting that together? Who's got the equipment to show all of that? That, you know, endless details. And then, you know, final point on the slide is about food. After the service, will there be a repast at a person's home, um, at a restaurant? Who's paying for it? That often falls on the assistant to figure that out. You know, what I learned about funerals, about the, from the many funerals I've attended, that they're events. They are events, not unlike any other kind of event that assistants manage. You know, they have the added layer of grief and, you know, sadness and lots of emotions, but they are events. And um, in my book, Be the Ultimate Assistant, I actually write about it. And, and I, it, what always comes to mind when I talk about this subject is the worst funeral I ever attended. It was, it was heartbreaking, the, but it was so poorly run. You know, funerals are sad anyway. Death is sad. Um, 
so there's stress and there's sadness and there's grief. So what you hope is that at least they're, they're well run. And I went to one that was so poorly run and I, through the whole thing, I kept thinking, wow, where is the assistant? Where, where are they? The funeral was for a teenager who died during a surgical procedure. So it was really sudden, really unexpected. And because it's a young person, the younger the person is, usually that means the more people will be at the funeral because it's all the, the young person's friends along with the parents' friends who are, you know, probably on the younger side as opposed to when someone, you know, really elderly passes away. That's kind of general. The uh, service took place in a synagogue and there had to be close to a thousand people there and they only had one person managing the crowd and getting them through you know the event it started late because people were having trouble finding seats and they didn't have enough seats you know it's hard to predict who how many people are going to show up you know I gr grant you that but there was not enough staff on hand to manage all of those people so think to yourself all those cars and and then the leaving of all those people and the gridlock that happened because they did not have police hired they did not have a team of people there to manage the flow of of um cars and traffic and then there's one other thing uh, that i think is valid to bring up about this and that's the person who spoke was a religious person but that person did not know the young girl who had died and they did not have anybody who knew the young girl to speak and it i have to say i felt like it was um you know not well done at all because surely in that thousand person group there were a few people who who knew her and could have spoken passionately and and wonderfully about her now of course all of this is really a personal decision but i just want to say this out loud in case it, it resonates with anyone listening to this that you know it makes sense that somebody who knew the person who died should be talking you know, even if somebody speaks who didn't know her wouldn't it have been great to have at least one person i'm just saying and and the idea that you know there was all of this gridlock and potential for car accidents outside in the parking lot you know that made n no sense to me that how unprepared they were for this massive group of people uh, and you know getting onto the highway and having to make their way now to the cemetery and i remember there were very it was not very good directions for that either so it, it just was really poorly done anyway i know that if you are listening to this that anything you will be planning will be much better handled than that uh, I want to offer a few resources on this subject and hopefully your mind is going and wanting to know more. So Caitlin Dougherty is a mortician and she has a website and she's written a book called From Here to Eternity. A great title, not just a great movie. It's a great title for a book. And Caitlin believes in having a good death. A good death and that means you know to answer everyone's questions and to have kind of a sense of humor about it and to you know um, look at death as, as simply a part of life uh, there's a reference called the five wishes directive it's tied to the advanced directive it's the questions to ask about a person's point of view on how much uh, extraordinary measures should be taken to keep someone alive and then Linda Ellis who um, wrote this book called live your dash uh, it's it was started with a poem 
called the Dash. And you know how up on the screen I had um, that Olympia lived from 1924 to, to 2021. And in between those two dates, there's a dash. And so the poem, which is a wonderful poem, speaks to the notion of what are you doing? What happened in that dash? What, what happened? What happened? What will happen for you? I think to myself about my own dash and what do we want for our lives before it ends? And, you know, none of us knows what tomorrow is going to bring, right? We just don't know. So we have to, I would hope that we live each, each day with purpose and being open um, with other people. And when this subject is appropriate to bring up that we deal with it honestly and with a minimum of stress and angst. So when you get the call, will you be ready? That's the question that I started with today and am asking you now and that Perhaps there will be resources that you will access that will help you be more ready to deal with these tricky issues as they come up. Um, I want you to be ready. And if you're not ready today, you can ask yourself this question, if not now, when? When will you do it? You know, we often say to ourselves, you know, I, I'll just wait till a better time. I'll wait. I'll wait till a different time, next month, next year. The truth is that I've known many people who've said that and it didn't work out the way that they thought it would. You know, the person we've heard about people who, you know, work so hard their whole life until they get to 65 and they retire, but at 64 and a half, they have a heart attack and die. You know, so, I think the pandemic has made us all think differently about our lives and the time we have every day, our 24 hours every day. So if not now, when? If you want your passing and your executive's passing to be smooth and be uh, organized, then I urge you to act sooner rather than later. And the resources I gave you hopefully will will make that happen. This is my granddaughter, Madison. And I show you Maddie's picture, not only because she's adorable, but to help us all remember that when we take action about the issues around death and dying, we're not only doing it for ourselves, we're really doing it for those we leave behind. We, for our grandkids, for our daughters, for our sons, for our friends, we're really being organized so that um, it's an act of love and kindness to have your affairs in order. You know, over the years, my sister and I would just laugh with my mom um, because inevitably when we would get together with mom, she would remind us, now girls, remember where all of these papers are and she would show us again. And and I, I swear that in reality, when it did happen, we were so much better prepared because mom did that. So I, you know, I have, made myself a promise that I'm doing that for my family and making sure that everything is in order to make it as easy as possible because we know it's stressful enough. Why wouldn't we wanna make it as easy as possible on those we're leaving behind? So if, don't only do it for yourself, do it for the people who you know will end up being responsible for dismantling your house, etc. So with that, I want to thank you all for listening to this presentation about the hard stuff, death and dying. 
I hope you will check out my website, bonnielocraman.com, and follow me on LinkedIn. I write a lot of articles and I post articles about lots of tough things, um, including workplace bullying and sexual harassment and the wage gap and not only issues of death and dying. I hope you will check out my book, Be the Ultimate Assistant, and consider training uh, the Be the Ultimate Assistant workshops or a workshop for your company for the assistants and or for the assistance with the leaders at your company. So with that, I thank you so much for your kind attention. Um, I wish you all the best in your work. Thank you so much. Bye now.